Hey everybody, it's Sam with Wrestling Overtime, and we are starting off tonight's WWE Raw in Ontario, California on February 10th, 2020. Um, they start off showing us a preview of what's going to happen tonight. Uh, we're going to have Becky Lynch versus Asuka for the Women's Championship. They're bringing back MVP with the VIP Lounge, and his guest is going to be Drew McIntyre. And then, of course, they have to throw in an eight-man tag match, tag match with the Viking Raiders, Samoa Joe, Kevin Owens versus AOP, uh, Buddy Murphy, and Seth Rollins. I mean, what would Raw be like if a three-hour show didn't have a six-man match or an eight-man match? I mean... It seems like we're having these every week, just driving me crazy that we got to have, you know, an eight-man tag match. Uh, hopefully, Becky and Asuka will be our main event, but they have, I don't know, they've really been after Seth Rollins, so who knows, since it was announced last, maybe, maybe it'll be our main event. Anyway... We start off with uh, AOP and Buddy Murphy and Seth Rollins already in the ring. Um, and Seth says, you know, he's not sure about the name being given to him, the Monday Night Messiah. But he understands now that it's difficult for people to make decisions. So he says basically why he's here is to speak the truth and make the decisions for you. And I'm assuming he's mean in the WWE universe. Um, they have to show flashbacks because Raw is the flashback show. Uh, they show flashbacks of last week's uh, six-man elimination match and how um, Kevin Owens basically calls Seth Chan Seth, his chance at the WWE Championship later that night, getting them back. Um, Kevin Owens and the Viking Raiders came out during that, and um, Seth talks about how his patience is, is just growing thin with Kevin Owens. Um, I don't blame him. Uh, if somebody was causing me not to do what I wanted to do, I guess my patience would grow thin. But, I mean, Seth, he doesn't have to let you do what you want to do. But anyway, K KO's music hits, and before Seth even says anything, uh, Kevin says, or Seth says, um... Don't get in over your head, K.O. He said, you remind me of how Samoa Joe got it in over his head, and now Samoa Joe got hurt. Seth says that um, he is Kevin Owens, Monday Night Messiah. He's the locker room's Monday Night Messiah. He's even the WWE Universe's. Uh, Monday Night Messiah, and Kevin says, you know, every week, Seth comes out sounding stupid, and now he's looking stupid on top of it. Thank you, and thank you, KO, for taking that verbal stunner and hitting Seth right upside the head with it, because he does look stupid. Um, that a uh, fur-collared leather short jacket looks stupid. Um, you know, it just, you and Buddy Murphy need to cut your little man buns off. Y'all, y'all look wild. I mean, thank you, Kevin Owens, for being a man of the people and telling them what's going on. But anyway, Kevin says, you know, he's not out here alone, so the Viking Raiders come out, and Kevin says, you know, he's sick and tired of them talking so much, and especially Seth, and so they head for the ring. So uh, Samoa Joe sneaks up behind Seth and gets him in the clutch while um, Kevin Owens and the Viking Raiders basically clear the ring. Um, this probably 
would have been better had you not previewed the eight-man tag match, though. Because when you previewed the eight-man tag match, you showed Samoa Joe. So pretty much everyone knew Samo Samoa Joe was back, um, that he was going to be wrestling in the eight-man tag match. So when he didn't immediately come out, his music didn't hit right after the Viking Raiders. Seth should have wondered, hey, what's up? Actually, AOP and Buddy Murphy, when Kevin Owens come out alone, should have been looking around saying, where are the Viking Raiders and Samoa Joe? I mean, come on. Come on, WWE. We are not that stupid. So, what they've done is Viking Raiders, Kevin Owens, and Samoa Joe come out they chase them off, they are celebrating in the ring, and Becky Lynch's music hits. Well, she just walks by them. Am I the only one that said, now, wait a minute? Or did the whole WWE universe forget that Becky Lynch is dating and is the fiancé of Seth Rollins? Did everybody forget that at one point they were going to be a mixed tag team? Did everybody forget how when they used to pass each other on the ramp, you know, they would say things to each other? So was I the only one in the WWE universe that thought Becky Lynch was actually going to come out and say something to Kevin Owens, Samoa Joe, and the Viking Raiders about beating up her man. I think that would have been hilarious. I think if as she was walking up the stairs, if she'd have shoved Samoa Joe off of him, or shoved him off the ramp, I think it would have been hilarious. Now, the announcers sell this as, you know, Becky just walks by him to show him whose ring it is. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Um, no, this, this, this isn't real. But anyway, um, the announcers start talking about, they're going to, the, they're doing the rematch now. So we're starting off uh, with a promo, and then we're going to immediately start off with the women's championship match. Hey, that's cool with me. You know, uh, starting off raw hot uh, would be great if they wouldn't have had the promo. I'd rather had a, a Becky Lynch promo. Why? Why can't we have that uh, first? Just start off hot that way, or let Becky end the show. I, I mean, it can't get any worse because obviously they're going to end the show with the eight man tag match. Anyway, Asuka comes out and she doesn't have her mask on. But she's got a mic. She starts speaking Japanese, and we hear Becky a couple times, and she continues speaking Japanese, and then we hear something like, easy peasy. Um, so throughout the match, uh, after it gets started, uh, Becky works on Asuka's arm. And I really like it now that Becky has picked up on working on a body part and hopefully her partner, whoever's in the ring with her, sells it and it just makes it a little bit more real. I feel like Becky's matches are now picking up a little bit. Uh, I guess it's WrestleMania season. Uh, she realizes, hey, I've kind of, since I got engaged, been kind of letting everybody down, kind of lowered my um, intensity and everything. I need to pick it back up. But like how she is working Oscar's arms. The announcers start talking about how Asuka's mind games don't seem to be working that well. But the king then, right after that, mentions how Asuka having uh, Kairi Sane on her side helps her. Well, why? Why? Uh, because almost autumn, uh, immediately after he gets done saying that, Sane interferes. Man, oh man, King, stay out of the match meetings. Stay out of the creative meetings. You are so much better 
of an announcer when you don't know what's going on. Maybe they can give you a couple bullet points to sell, but quit talking to the wrestlers about how their match flow is going to go. Because as soon as you said that, Sane interfered, and I know that you think it makes you look like a psychic, but no, no, it just makes you look like they went over their match with you. Um, I liked that Becky did the disarmor while Asuka was tangled up in the ropes. I thought that was a pretty cool idea. I thought it was a pretty good move. Um, overall, it was a pretty good match with Becky winning finally. I just felt like it was too long. Um, it wasn't that it was boring. Um, I was the whole entire time kind of wondering, you know, who was going to win. I liked the up and down of it and the comebacks and, and everything like that. But, I mean, this match lasted through two commercial breaks. And like I said, you know, we had the promo with Seth, uh, you know, beating on Kevin Owens verbally and then them having the beat down in the ring and then we immediately go to the championship match. We have at last two commercial breaks. Come on. I mean, WWE has about 300 wrestlers signed. Yes, I know they have three shows, but they can only get so many people on. And I would almost rather them do a little bit shorter matches, more vignettes, more storylines, or just release some wrestlers. Just release some wrestlers. You do not need to do a 15, 20 minute long match. Plus, number one, it's going to mean something. And it's going to be an excellent match, not just an average match. Or two, do not do that unless it's leading up to something. Or it's at a pay-per-view. You know, if you want to do a 20-minute match coming up at, at um, you know, Elimination ch Chamber or at the Saudi Arabia pay-per-view, great. Those things are supposed to be story uppers, meaning, um, you know, you're heightening the suspense and the intensity of a storyline, or they're supposed to be story enders, which means, you know, after this, there's going to be some kind of conclusion, and we're going to start new programs with both wrestlers, so the thing is, WWE, I don't need that long of a match on, you know, Raw, Show me more wrestlers. Show me more vignettes. Show me more storylines. Get me involved. I did, however, really mark out for, you know, Becky is celebrating her and Shayna Baszler pops in the ring and hits Becky from behind. She uses her sleeper hold. But before, you know, Becky can go to sleep, she just throws her down, smacks her basically face first into the mat, pops out her mouthpiece, and then proceeds just a bite. Becky Lynch's back of her neck. Um, and then she pops up, and Shayna's got, you know, blood coming from her mouth. Um, the king calls her a vampire. Um, let's not go there. Let's, King, I know you like to exaggerate, and you're from the 80s when they did all the crazy stuff, but let's, let's not go there. Um, I like snap, tap, or nap better. Um, I really did. Um, can we add this maybe to it somehow? Can WWE Creative put bite snap? tap or nap or something like that um i did like that that shana was doing something new i wasn't bothered by the bite i know a lot of people were all upset um would i have rather her put uh becky to sleep yeah probably um but the bite it was cool. It, it, it was. And I wanted to see what they were, were going to do with it. I thought it was weird. And I can't help but kind of laugh. Um, you know, the ref has gloves, but he can't get them on. 
He is trying to get him on, but he has just refereed a match, and he's touched Becky, who I'm sure was sweating. He has pulled at her hair, which means he, he may have gotten some of the substance they used on his hands. He can't get his hands in the glove. We hear Becky saying, she bit me. Can you take a look? Because she knows that's what the ref is supposed to be doing, is, hey, you're supposed to be looking at my neck so people can see that I've got blood on me, that it's oozing, and that I've got a bite, hello, but see, the ref is still messing with his gloves, and he tells Becky, the medics are coming, well, Becky kind of just rolls out of the ring kind of sets up and says, you know, I'm fine, I'm fine, just take it easy, and, and all of that, um, when the medics get there, so the paramedics, um, show them, um, during commercials, so this Becky Lynch segment, with Asuka coming out, with them having a match, and with Shayna coming out, has last three commercial breaks now. But I did like how during the commercial break, they used that to show the treatment, and then they showed her walk into the back. But I was thinking, man, oh man, um, how long is this going to take? You know, commercials in, at Raw are three or four minutes. Um, are we really going to spend a lot more time on this? I mean, she bit her. Um, obviously, she bit her really good because Shayna had so much blood, supposedly, all over her. But, um, you know, I'm thinking, let, let's, let's go. So, we see Mojo Rawley and Riddick Moss come out. Well, then, as they're walking, we flash back to Becky. Now, I understand that Becky, um, I've had a cut, um, I've had stitches, I understand that, you know, when something gushes blood, that you get blood on your hands. But it is very obvious that when Becky shows her hands that they are stained. So, um, WWE, you, uh, you really didn't, didn't do well with whatever substance you used. Need to get, um, a, a movie magic maker to, uh, figure out what substance you're going to use if you're going to keep this with Shayna. But, uh, Becky says she doesn't need to go to the hospital, and, of course, they're telling her she does. So, they go back to Mojo Rawley. And, I'm like, what is the 24-7 used for now? What good is it? Um, because it's obvious that Mojo's having a match. And we, we know when whoever the 24-7 champion is in a match, then they suspend the rules so that they cannot lose the 24-7 title during the match. So I'm thinking, WWE, you have had Mojo have this. He keeps saying he's not a coward. He's not a running person. But yet... If he's in a match, it's not for the 24-7 title. So, I'm thinking, WWE, you either use it or get rid of it. I mean, where is R-Truth? It seems like R-Truth has been gone since he messed around with Brock. I, I guess they're playing up that maybe he's injured. Yes, I'm doing the finger quotes. But, uh, where is R-Truth? Great. Um, the Street Profits are coming out now to talk us to death. I mean, come on. Uh, what are they doing? Um, I don't want to hear them right now. This reminds me, where is AEW's private party? Um, where have they been? I haven't seen AEW's private party. Are they on AEW Dark right now? Or they, did they take off or something like that? I mean... I don't know, but in, anyway, um, of course the street pop, 
uh, prophets finally get to the ring and they start a yakking. Uh, they call Mojo a card for, for hiding behind Moss and then start talking about how Mojo is riding Grom and they do their smoke line. Great. Um, not sure that he's hiding behind Riddick Moss. Um, stupid name. Anyway, he, um, they haven't bi- built Riddick Moss up to be this big bad guy or anything. I haven't seen Mojo hide behind him. I haven't seen him shove him in front of him so that somebody won't get the, the 24-7 titles. And I'm not sure that Mojo is riding Gronk's coattails because um, Mojo hasn't went anywhere. I know that he was down at Gronk's uh, Super Bowl party and beach party and stuff like that, but um, it's not getting him anywhere. But but anyway, anyway, um, it's a tag match. That's why private parties out there. So we're going to suspend the 24-7 championship rules to have a tag match with Mojo Raleigh, Riddick Moss, and the Street Profits? Are you serious? We just spent three commercials on Becky Lynch, Asuka, and Shayna Baszler, and this is what you're giving me next? You're giving me Mojo Raleigh, Riddick Moss, and the Street Profits? You've you've got to be kidding. So Mojo starts out and immediately just tags Moss in so he can be the jobber. Because they don't want Mojo, their 24-7 champion, getting pinned. And they don't want these two beating the Street Profits and them, like, losing any kind of momentum that they have. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that they got any. But anyway, um, so the Street Profits roll up Moss. And he's a jobber. Great! So Mojo starts questioning Moss while the Street Profits sneak out. Now this is the only time I've ever seen the Street Profits sneak out. I was looking around and trying to see, were they not going to yak some more? But they didn't. I'll give them credit for that. But Mojo starts questioning Ross, or Moss, and as soon as that starts happening, you know what's going to happen. You know that Moss is rolling him up for the 24-7 win. Uh, because immediately after the match, then the 24-7 rules supposedly start up again again. So there it is. The 24-7 belt is back. I knew Vince wasn't going to let that die. He absolutely loves the 24-7 belt. But here's the thing. Mojo didn't even bother to chase him. Riddick Moss jumped over the barricades and took off through the crowd and Mojo looked at him like, you are stupid. And he didn't even bother to chase him. So then we've got to go through. A, they flash back to the back. And Becky is still walking to the ambulance. Say what? Why is Becky still walking to the ambulance? Don't they have a golf cart back there for injuries? What kind of arena is this? She ends up going outside to the ambulance. They couldn't have picked her up inside. This is an arena. This is WWE. They could not at any point drove the ambulance into the arena and pick Becky up. No, we waited through a whole entire monologue by the Street Profits. We had a tag match, and then Moss beat Mojo for the 24-7 championship and jumped the barricade, ran away, and Becky's still not in the ambulance. Becky still not even made it to the ambulance. So they get up to the ambulance, and Becky kicks them. Becky, what are you doing? Why are you kicking paramedics? Why are you pulling the driver out to drive away in the ambulance? WWE, or even Becky, wouldn't it have made more sense 
for you to kick them and go back in the arena looking for Shayna? How about, wouldn't it have made more sense for her to pull the driver out and drove the ambulance back into the arena and went and looked for Shayna? But anyway, I guess Becky decides I need to go to the hospital. I need to do it, and obviously, this driver can't get me there fast enough, so I'll drive myself. Is that what, what Becky decided? Because, here's the thing. When she gets in the ambulance, Becky takes a while. You know why she took a while? No, no, it's not because she needed to put her seatbelt on. It is because she wants to turn on the lights and the siren of the ambulance before she drives away. Now, number one, Becky is Irish. Her background says nothing about her being a paramedic. So, Becky, how do you know where the lights and the siren is? Because I don't, I don't, if I got in an ambulance right now, I would not know where to look. It would take me a little while, and I hope that it would be labeled, and I could turn them on. But here's the other thing. Becky, you don't live in Ontario, California. I'm sure you've been there before. But how do you know where the hospital is? Did someone leave their phone there in the seat so that you could pull it up on Google Maps? Or did they leave directions to the hospital, like taped to the dashboard? Because, I mean, all ambulance need directions from the arena to the hospital on the dashboard. Because it was pretty obvious Becky didn't have her cell phone on her because she got done wrestling a match. So WWE and Becky, this was stupid. This is nonsense. Becky, you should have went to Vince on this. Becky, I know you are smarter than this. I don't know why you agreed to do this. It doesn't make sense. So then we have MB, MVP come out for his VIP lounge segment. And his guest is going to be Drew McIntyre. So Drew comes down and the guards act like Drew isn't on the list. So Drew has to bust through them. He apologizes to MVP. And you can tell this is not starting off good. Uh, basically, MVP offers to be Drew's manager or advocate or business advisor or whatever, and Drew says he doesn't need an external brain thinking for him, and MVP says Drew needs him. So, Drew headbutts him, and then when he gets up, Claymore's him. Um... Paul Heyman, is this your segment? Um, this this was ridiculous use of MVP. Um, basically, a ridiculous use of Drew McIntyre. Uh, Drew is better than this. He can do better promos than this. Just think up something else for this. Uh, of course, then we get the flashback from two weeks ago where Edge and Randy Orton, and they preview that Randy's going to come out tonight and talk about what he did to Edge. Didn't he do that last week? Didn't we see this same exact preview, and then they said, oh, Randy's going to come out, and then Randy came out and said, yeah, I'm not talking about it. So did they put him in Vince's office and uh, Vince slapped his hand with a ruler and says all this week, Randy, you're going to talk about it because the announcers do not mention it. They don't mention all oh, this is for the second week in a row. They don't mention all oh, Randy is uh, been grounded for the last week by Vince so he's got to come out and try again. I don't know. This also is stupid. 
But then we see Angel Garza come out with Selena Vega uh, versus Cedric Alexander. Where's Cedric Alexander been? I guess he's been doing, you know, dark matches and, and main event matches. But um, I can't believe it. Uh, when I see that, I'm like, oh my gosh. Um, Angel Garza is not taking on a Latino? Uh, because, remember, I had been griping for the last couple podcasts that this has been the Andrade, Mysterio, Humberto, Garza, uh, Dominic, all the Latinos, they've been usually using in just one segment, and they've been fighting over the United States Championship. So when I see Cedric Alexander, I'm like, oh my gosh, WWE's been paying attention to the WWE Universe and what they've been saying. So Vega takes the mic, and of course, she wants them to show a flashback of Garza destroying Humberto and Mysterio. And then, of course, Angel has to talk on the mic. So, immediately, Humberto's music hits, and he runs to the ring, and he slams him before the refs pull Humberto away. And I'm like, we had, we had to do it, because, you know, we, we have to have a Latino segment, and I'm like, this, this is stupid. So, the refs tell Garza to get in the ring, and they start the match. Well, this became a little bit longer match than what I thought it was going to be, because I thought it was basically going to be Garza getting in there and just one, two, three in him. But he didn't. It was a little bit longer match. Uh, Alexander got a little bit of offense, but not much. And Garza just whips him, which he should. They're pushing him, but um, I don't think we needed all that. Anyway, we go back to another flashback of uh, Charlotte last Monday. She was going to choose, you know, her being the Rumble winner, she was supposed to choose who she was going to go after at WrestleMania. So they showed Rhea Ripley coming out. And, um, basically challenging Charlotte to pick her. Well, they go immediately to an interview by Charlie. And she's interviewing Rhea Ripley. Interesting. Interesting that Rhea Ripley just shows up at Raw. So Charlie's first question is, are you still waiting for an answer from the queen? So, um, Ripley says no. She gets up, gets out, and does what needs to be done until she gets what she wants. Okay. So, you didn't hear from Charlotte. Then, why are you in California? Because NXT takes place in Florida, Orlando, Florida. So why did you fly clear across the country if you're not going to confront Charlotte, if you're not going to get an answer? So you got, got up, you decided to get out and do what was necessary, which was fly to California until you get what you want. So, as I'm thinking that through, she's interrupted by Sarah Logan. Are you serious? Um, Logan says she just can't come to Raw anytime she wants. Well, amen, Sarah Logan. That's just what I was saying and thinking. Uh, but Ripley says, I am real Ripley. Who are you? And then she walks away. Well, I'll tell you what, I loved it. I absolutely love that Rhea Ripley did that to Sarah Logan because Rhea Ripley is higher on the totem pole than Sarah Logan ever got. Go be with your Viking Raiders, Sarah Logan. Uh, You don't need to be here. 
just go be with the Viking Raiders. Leave Rhea alone. And let me talk to Rhea and say, Rhea, why are you flying from Florida to California knowing you're going to have to fly back later tonight or first thing tomorrow morning? You're crazy. Anyway, they show Bobby Lashley. And I'm looking at my watch. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, it's got to be the 10 o'clock hour. No, no, it, 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 it's not the 10 o'clock hour. Um, why is it not the 10 o'clock hour? If they're showing Bobby Lashley, doesn't Lana have to be around somewhere? And doesn't it have to be 10 o'clock? Because I thought they were the 10 o'clock show. It was the Lashley-Lana show. But I guess not. Anyway, um, they show Bobby Lashley using his resistance bands as Lana watches. And then Lana tells the interviewer to be respectful because Lashley's warming up and she doesn't need to be interrupting and that he's facing Ricochet tonight. Lana said that Ricochet stole Lashley's dream. Now, as Lana is going on and on and on about this, you can see Lashley getting all upset, and he says, you know, Ricochet took advantage of the opportunity to beat me. But when he's done with Ricochet, that Ricochet is not going to make it to Super Showdown. Okay. Okay. Good promo. Not not bad. Can't believe you guys aren't on in the 10 o'clock hour. But, hey, not bad. So then we see Sarah Logan come around the screen and down the ramp, introducing herself as she's walking to the ring. Are you serious? You're, you're going to introduce yourself? And then she hollers for Rhea Ripley to come on out. Well, Rhea Ripley does. She she comes around, and let me tell you, Raw, get your act together. For Rhea Ripley, you are giving her not only a push on Raw, possibly giving her a push at a pay-per-view. You are giving her a push at NXT. Her entrance is better at NXT then you guys made it at Raw. And that's sad. Get your act together. Um, So Rhea Ripley um, comes down basically to uh, beat up Sarah Logan. And Charlotte's music hits. First thing I notice, she's not in ring gear. She doesn't have her robe on. She's in a semi-normal outfit, and she just waves to Rhea Ripley, and uh, I loved it. It was perfect. Charlotte is back. She is back. She's got someone of her stature to mess with. She can play mind games. She can sit up there and wave and act cocky and I love it because Rhea Ripley is the perfect foil for her to go against uh Rhea Ripley doesn't break eye contact with her throughout the match it was awesome Ripley had to plan that match to do moves where she didn't really have to look and that she could kind of keep eye contact with Charlotte. She broke away, I think, twice maybe, but it was just for a couple seconds, and it was awesome. Um, because as she's destroying Sarah Logan, Charlotte is making faces, encouraging her, doing her little golf clap, and it was unbelievable you could feel their tension building and then charlotte gets a mic 
Rhea gets a mic, and Ripley says, where's my answer to my challenge? And Charlotte says, maybe that's just how the queen operates. And Rhea goes to say something, and Charlotte says, well, how do we even know you'll still be the NXT champion? by Wrestlemania, and then, of course, she woos, and walks away, perfection, that was worth me putting up with Sarah Logan, interrupting Rhea Ripley, that was worth Rhea Ripley getting up and flying from Florida to California to do that segment, to make that segment, then, like I said, she'll either catch the red eye or she'll get up early the next morning and she'll fly back to Florida because that was how you do it. And I love this. I I want Charlotte to give her the answer where she will take her on at WrestleMania. I, I'm excited. So then we have to have a flashback. Uh, to last week's triple threat with um, Lashley and Seth Rollins and then Ricochet. And Ricochet won last week. So Lashley and Lana come out and Ricochet is being interviewed. And all he basically says in his interview is that he doesn't back down from a fight. He goes out, they have a kind of short, sweet, decent match. I mean, I'm not sure that Lashley can give us a great match, uh, so I wasn't really expecting that. My expectations were kind of low, but um, Ricochet, I do expect him to bounce all over the place. Love that he did this 360 for the win, and, you know, it was okay. So, we do, after commercial, we do a a recap of what's happened so far, and then Randy Orton's music hits, and I'm telling you, every podcast, you're going to hear me talk about how much I love Randy Orton, and I love his music, Um, so as he gets ready to possibly start telling us why he went after Edge, the Hardy Boys music hits. And I'm like, what? Did they let Jeff come back? Already? I mean, he's only been gone for, I don't know, 10 years. No, no, no. It's it's Matt Hardy. And he's speaking normal. So he's not woken, Matt Hardy. He's the Hardy Boys. Matt Hardy. Now, of course, he doesn't come out dancing or or doing his typical Hardy Boys thing. And he's wearing his hair like he's broken Matt Hardy. But he's talking normal, so I'm confused. But anyway, anyway, um, he wants to know why Randy did that to Edge. And, you know... Matt Hardy hasn't been used in months. He's getting ready to leave. His time is almost up. So he, for someone that hasn't been being used, he does cut a decent guilt promo. You know, uh, trying to guilt Randy um, and make him feel bad for hurting Edge. But, um, it was, it was okay. It, it wasn't anything to write home about. But anyway, Randy goes for the RKO, and I'm excited, and Matt slips it. And Matt kind of beats on Randy, and Randy gets a little bit of room, and he shoves Matt away. So, that's all he needed. He RKO's Matt Hardy and then goes and gets a chair and does the same exact thing to him as he did to Edge. Love it. Um, Like 
Randy when he's being evil and he's beating the crap out of people. Love it, love it, love it. Love it that now Matt Hardy is trying to sell that on social media that, you know, he is in a, a chair of wheels and all that garbage. Uh, stay in the chair of wheels until you can get released and go be broken somewhere. Anyway, they flash back to last week when Ruby Wright come out and tore up Liv Morgan. And um, they do an interview with Ruby Riot, And they say that uh, Liv is just a follower. And that she doesn't know what to do on her own. And now Ruby is back. And that she had to put Liv back in her place. And that Liv will strike when Ruby Riot says so. Short and sweet, great. The women are taking it tonight. They are doing well. I mean, we had a decent, pretty good, a too, little too long, but pretty good match between Asuka, Becky. Shayna comes out, bites Becky. Other than Becky taking her good old time with the ambulance and driving away, and we don't really know why. But then we get Charlotte and Rhea Ripley. Awesome. Then we get Ruby Riot. Awesome. The women are showing it tonight. We get Alistair Black's opening, his entrance, and he's going to take on Akira Zawa. This is a total jobber match. We've seen Tozawa before. It always equals jobber. It was quick. Uh, basically, it was just to get Black out there and him to be able to do his entrance in order to cut a promo. I haven't heard him talk a lot. Like I said, didn't follow him in NXT. So, um actually enjoyed his promo about feeling like an animal in a cage and how his opponents he is warning them that when they get in the ring that he is going to be an animal and that the ring is a cage and i'm like not bad not bad at all gave me a little bit more depth to alistair black i'm i'm cool with that however him saying he feels like an animal in a cage where's eric rowan been and that stupid cage he's carrying around. Hopefully we have dropped that and we have dropped him. Anyway, Becky's back with her ambulance. Um, the siren is still running. Um, she does drive it into the arena and leaves it running and the siren running. Good job, Becky. Um, and, of course, her music hits, and she walks out with an next bandage on. So she did find the hospital. Good job, Becky. Um, she looks into the camera and says, Hey, Shayna, they gave me something real nice for the pain, and now I'm back to smash your head in. Mission accomplished, Becky. You have my attention. Um, I love it that Shayna now has your attention. I love it that Becky looks right into the camera and says, You better find me before I find you. Great. Love it. She hit the right notes. She had the right intensity. Love it, Beckley. I think it was awesome. You were not in robotic mode. You were in Becky mode. Becky the man mode. Becky the man that accidentally got smashed in the nose by Nia Jax and had blood on her face and was challenging Ronda Rousey. I love it. She is back. She is back and this time she is ready for WrestleMania and I love it. Well then they've got to show a preview of the Super Showdown. 
And at the Super Showdown, they're going to have a gauntlet match. For the Tawait Trophy? Now, what is that? What is the Tawait Mountain Trophy? Explain, announcers. Oh, you're not? You're not going to explain? Eh, okay. But we see by the preview that it's going to be AJ Styles, R-Truth, Rusev, Andrade, Lashley, and Eric Rowan. Oh, Eric, I was just wondering where you were. So, we're going to have a good mixture of people that are going to get beat up and people who are not. We've got our choose Lashley and Rowan in there that, you know, they're going to get beat up. And then we have AJ Styles, Rusev, and Andrade. Andrade, you're going to come back after your little wellness suspension, and you aren't going to miss a beat. Hey, not bad, not bad, not bad at all. So then we get our wonderful main event that we have been waiting for. Uh, yeah, not really. Not really. Um, we haven't been waiting for this at all. I am only watching it to see what we're, you know, going to gonna do. But anyway, um, the match gets started when they, talk, uh, they attack Seth. Seth was wanting to talk some more, and they decided, no. No, you're not going to talk. And so... All eight guys start the match just beating the crap out of each other. Um, I'm going to be honest with you. I got totally bored with this match. I don't care. Where are we going with this story? Because the story of Seth cheating to win is getting old. I hate eight men tag matches because all eight men have to be involved. They have to spread it around. Each of them has to get in the ring and do their little stuff or whatever, their moves. And I don't know. This is stupid. Um, what is the storyline? It is, let's refocus. It is Seth being the Monday Night Messiah and getting disciples. And how Kevin Owens and Samoa Joe are trying to stop it. And the Viking Raiders are just there to even it up. I know we're headed for Kevin Owens, Samoa Joe against Buddy Murphy and Seth Rollins. Great. Let's get there. This is not a WrestleMania event. You're going to do this at Super Showdown. At worst case, it's going to last maybe to Elimination Trader. I hope not. But it's basically going to be a Super Showdown match. So let's get with it. Quit dragging it out with the stupid eight-man tag team matches. If you want Viking Raiders and AOP to fight, great. Put them on Monday or uh, main event. Put them on dark matches. I don't care. I hate the Viking Raiders. They're boring. So, let's get it over. Let's go Samoa Joe, Kevin Owens versus Buddy Murphy, Seth Rollins, and let's go. So, overall, basically, this show was the women's show. You're still doing too many flashbacks. Or, let me put it this way, you're doing too long of flashbacks. Some flashbacks don't need to be flashbacks. They just to be need to be the announcers reminding us. Or getting people caught up for not watching last week. Everything does not need to be a flashback. Number two. Guys, you better step up your game. Because the women, they're not in a lot of storylines. But the storylines they're in, they're big. And they're getting intense. They're peaking at the right time. So guys on Raw, if you guys are going to hold up your end of the bargain, you better step it up. But I'm telling you, the women are the reason to watch Raw now. Um, Smackdown. 
you just flat out gotta step it up. Because Raw bringing it compared to you. But anyway, this is my take on things, and I will talk to you guys soon.